And it and I relaxed, it just said I said, oh, and she's right here with this 35 millimeter camera. She did like she like right here in my booty, like this. I said, oh Jesus. Hey, the bait hit the water and just skipped. I didn't even work it. They jumping all over. I just start reeling the bait straight in. Look like this looked like one of them old Sabio swim baits. Just nothing coming through the water. I just reeled it right in. She ain't said a word now. And this sounds like rocks in a five-gallon bucket. So we both know we at this position in our life. I just reeled the rod in. I set it down on the front deck and I turned and looked at this like this. As well as I could, as polite as I could, I said, Miss Mary, I crapped my pants. <laughs> And she said, without missing the beat, she said, son, are you sure? I said, ma'am, I am real sure that I have crapped my drawers. Dead serious. And I ain't talking about a little bit. I'm talking about embarrassing. And it's so bad that I can't even get down in that triton and crank that mercury up. I don't want to get down and sit down. There's a big fight that went on back here. So I put a life jacket on, you know, I'm mad, embarrassed. I got my knee up on the seat. <laughs> I'm idling over here. If y'all ever go to Lake Hamilton, Arkansas, there's a house like every four inches in their mansions. They ain't nowhere to go. I find me one pine tree with some pretty rose bushes around it, out just right on the edge of the water, out front of about three, four million dollar mansion. I'm a redneck now. Any port in a the storm, them roses looking pretty good at this time. I just took that trot and I idled up on the mic. Joke, 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 joke. I got up there. I said, I'll be back, Miss Mary. I come back to the boat. And I'm embarrassed. I mean, the fish done quit schooling. And I do do them britches. <laughs> Miss Mary's embarrassed. She said, well, if, if, if you don't mind, girl, one way over here on the bank, do you mind if I go? I said, not in them bushes you ain't. I'm going to tell you right now. Find you somewhere else. When they come down, they're going to think Sasquatch is living in Hamilton, Arkansas. <laughs> and he wearing a pair of loose leg boxers. I'm going to tell you. I get back out that day and I go on to catch myself 10 pounds. I end up making the Bass Masters Classic. That's a good day, but it's so funny because when I weighed in that day, that's when Fish Fisher was still with us. And Fish leans over, he puts his arm around me on stage. He said, Gerald, tell us a little bit about your day out there on the water today. I'm just sitting there looking at all y'all on TV. I'm like, well, I poo pooed my britches. <laughs> I don't want nobody looking. I had to go. <laughs> you know, I said, I want to say, I ain't got no draws on. I can tell you that. I caught 10 pounds. I made a classic, but I ain't got no draws on. So, if you ever want to know what our world's like, there's a whole lot of that behind the scenes. It'll never be out of TV. And people say, man, I can't believe that y'all do that stuff. I said, hey, man, I'm just like you guys. I mean, I live everyday life, and I'm out there fighting to make a dollar, and stuff happens. And I'll just be honest with you. I may make a lot of smart, elegant remarks, and people say, man, he just, he just old redneck that's just too smart. And I make a lot of fun of myself. First person on my priority list when it comes to making fun of somebody is me because I do some dumb stuff. I do some stuff so dumb I just had to write a book about it one time. So that's just kind of how our life is. It's, I just want to share a little bit of inside of that. And then, you know, I know what y'all saying. That man just told a story about poo in his pants. He want to share the inside. Just letting y'all know I'm me. Y'all come to the classic at Gunner. Y'all ever see me go up on an island? I'm not looking for shells. <laughs> Don't mark that on your GPS. I promise you. I'm just up there doing a little nature exploring. Hollering from shaking the bush, boss. Anybody got a question? I seen somebody a minute ago had a hand up before I went on it. Yes, sir. The question is, the gentleman's got a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that one before. He's asking, in my career, when I was talking to somebody, maybe somebody was mentoring me or helping me, has anyone ever talked to me about things that I could do to, for winning to help me win? And I'll be honest with you, no. No. I, uh, it's really weird how that works for me. I've never had that guy close to me that I taught myself to fish. I, I, had, a, I had a team partner named Johnny McCombs that I grew up fishing with. He was absolutely the best fisherman I'd ever been in the boat with in my life. And I've been in a boat with all of them. He got strung out on drugs, and he's not no longer fishing, and I kind of lost my team partner, and he was the guy that I learned to fish with. And everything I've learned has kind of been a school of hard knocks, and even uh, when it comes to winning. And, and, and just to be perfectly honest with you, that's probably why I don't win a lot of events on the Elite Series. I have a lot of top tens. I make a lot of Bassmasters Classic, but sometimes when he gets right on the threshold of winning the big events, maybe I don't handle that situation right, or maybe I don't manage my fish right. But not, I really... I have not. I've talked to more people now about winning than, than people who actually helped me about winning. You touched on something. Managing your fish. How, how important do you think that is? I mean, when you're going to go to the classic, and I'm not looking at you're going to go out there, do you try to 
Great question is, how do you manage your fish? The gentleman's asking me, how do you manage your fish? You go and you fish all these events. Do you sit and burn them down on one on day one? Do you get on a big school and sit there and catch everything you catch? You know, catch 20 pounds and cull two 18-pound stringers and come in and 23's leading. You know, you're thinking, maybe I should have stayed on them harder. That's that's one of them touch and go things, man. I, I, I'm one of the guys that, I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I play life reckless. I live it wide open. I'm one of them that, son, I don't leave nothing on the water. I'm, I'm just a kid at heart. If they bite in mine, most of the time, I'm going to stay and catch them. Unless I'm catching 12 inches, and it's not going to help me. If I'm catching big fish, I'm going to stay and catch them. Uh, because it's every time to me, if I pull off that spot, somebody's probably going to found it, and they're going to come in there and catch them too. You know, now, I may back outside that spot and throw bigger baits. Uh, for instance, you're talking about the bass master. Yeah, you know, to try to see if I can catch a bigger one and not catch the little ones. I may be on a school of four pounders at Kentucky Lake and I'm catching them on a deep diving crankbait and I may pull outside that and start stroking a big white jig or something to see if I can catch a giant and not catch those, but yet guard it. It's kind of a fish management program, but most of the time if I'm junk fishing, I just pretty much try to get, you know, get as many bites as I can and catch them. Uh, at the Classic this year, it's funny you ask that, uh, I'm already prepared at the Classic. To, the way I plan on fishing on day three will not be the way I fish on day two and it will not be the way I fish on day one. It'll be a protection of how I can manage my fish and knowing that you could possibly have 70 or 80 boats following you and you can't move. You can't make that adjustment. If I show, if I show two aces on day one, you won't get to fish it no more. So you got to kind of stay day one. That's a whole different level of competition than what you're trying to plot. And that's a lot of thinking goes involved in that. I know I think it's going to take about 26 pounds a day to win gunners or maybe 27. So I don't need to come in less than anything less than 24 to have a chance to win. But you probably don't need to fish your number one spot right off the bat with the helicopters and the crowds and the spectators because no matter what it is, when you leave there, somebody's going to fish it. You just, they can't help it. Do you mean somebody in the tournament? Not somebody in the tournament, just somebody following you. They will fish it. That comes back to that PMA and that rubber band because sometimes i got to pop it a lot because you know it's all you got and you pull off there and somebody's fishing they're idling over it so it gets a little complicated but fish management is most definitely a key at a tournament uh I, I guess the question is knowing if that's all you got if it's the only spot you got you might want to manage it a little better uh most of the time i've seen that people's pulled off fish and end up getting beat by not fishing harder you know it seems like it's a uh, fishing's like a momentum thing when you get it going your way you just kind of need to roll with it because there's no guarantee you might come back here on day two and they not bite at all the biggest school of fish I've ever found in my fishing career was at Toledo Bend when I lost to Dean Rojas by one ounce. I have never found a school of fish that big. It was the easiest, dumbest. I made three casts with an RC 2.5 and caught three sets of doubles. They were all four pounders. You couldn't throw it in there that two of them didn't eat it at the same time. It was the stupidest thing, and I didn't start there. I went to another spot and caught him and caught him. I said, I'm going to go check my number one spot. I went in there and I caught a six and a four. Give me about 22 pounds that day, and I left. The wind changed directions. I've never got another bite right there. Looking back on that, oh, Lord, I wish I'd have stayed there and caught every one of them on day one. So it's a prime example. Sometimes you outthink yourself. You know, I could have possibly sit there and caught 25, 26 pounds and won a tournament. I mean, only lost by one ounce. So second guess yourself. Yes, sir. How close do they get to you? I can hear them breathing. I can smell them smoking cigarettes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I got disqualified by Randy Howe, I was probably uh, 20 yards running wide open. But, you know, I just I did what the guy told me to do. He told me to come on. And the particular uh, river we were in, it's only about four foot up there, and it's all rocks. And if I shut down, you take a chance of tearing your boat up and I'm pushing against four turbines, which is running, which is gonna make a huge mud line. So the guy says, come on. I come on, hey, it is what it is. They thought it was dangerous, they DQ'd me. I said, you know, uh, if you ride in the car with Dale Jr. next Saturday, you're gonna think what he's doing is dangerous, but to him, he does it every day. So it's, it's a matter of opinion of what we think is dangerous. I don't advocate driving boat reckless at all. I don't trim them off a lot, man. I, uh, I trim my skirt just where it doesn't touch my chunk, wherever that is. If your skirt legs, any of that skirt touches the legs of your chunks, no matter what kind, it won't swim as good. 
I, mean, I, I got a real simple deal with it, and I see people tie knots. They tie their knot and their floor carving. You ever see guys doing that? And they get, they get, of course, you got to wet it. They do all that, mm -hmm, licking all over it, you know. And they, of course, there's all kind of bacteria in the water. That's probably why you got these stomach problems at night. And they start to pulling that line down there, like, oh, God, that's a knot right there. Mm, yeah. Well, okay, let's just do the math on this. Back to math class. I'm 203 pounds, and I'm pulling everything I got on that line. Floor carving has zero stretch. You just burn it in half. Don't snug it down. Just get it tight. That's why it breaks so much when people jerk. No matter whose floor carbon it is, if you pull that knot on a short string and let me pull it tight and you go jerk it, it's going to break because you burn it. It's got nowhere to give. And then I get guys, I see them take their tweezers and they get the knot tied and they get the tag in sticking out. You ever seen a guy do that? And he gets down there with a pair of tweezers and he trims it down to like a microfiber sticking out. And I tapped that dude on his shoulder. It's the guy's honest through the co-angler, like Norman. He's doing all that holding up the sun, trying to trim the twig down. I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, hey, you think if he's seen that first 110 feet, that last one inch is going to hurt him? <laughs> think about it, fellas. You just threw 70 yards, and you worried about a quarter of an inch of a tag in. I'll have a cat whisker hanging off mine. I don't care. If he's that smart, I can't catch him anyway. Don't worry about the little stuff. If you're throwing it where enough of them live, you can catch them. Yes, sir. I, I think you learn. Uh, uh, in my situation, honestly, I think as my career has gotten further along and you get more traffic around you, you learn to cope with it better. Early on, it, I would get a little jumpy about it. Uh, it's going to sound very cliche or kind of stupid, but dude, without the fans, when they quit wanting to watch me, that's when I got something to worry about. You know, and if I'm going to turn around and yell at 50 fans because they want to come watch me, then what am I doing for the sport? You know, as long as the guy don't throw on top of me and he's respectful, I want to be respectful of the fact that he drove four hours and put his boat in in the freezing cold to watch me. You just learn to deal with it. The biggest problem you have is trying to find a place to pee if you want to know the truth. I mean, you, I don't know how else to tell you. There ain't no bathroom out there, and you got 50 people chasing you around going, where are you going? I'm hunting a place to pee. <laughs> I'm running around this island seven times. Hope I lose you. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we see that a lot. It, dude, I've, like I said, I learn more now. Like when I pull in on a spot, and say I want to fish an offshore structure spot, and I got 15 or 20 boats following me, when I leave there, you're going to be probably more confused than you was when you got there. And I, it's, a, it's a simple. I don't stop on the spot. I may stop 200 yards up from it. And I may fish some random baits just killing time till you kind of get bored with it. And I may hit a flurry and I'll catch them. And if you ain't careful and ain't paying attention, I'll pull you 500 yards down a, off a river channel just fishing. And then I'll crank up and leave. The worst thing you can do is pull in and catch a lemon off a spot, jerk the trolling motor and leave because then you pinpointed where you was at. So it's my job as a professional to kind of keep that playing field a little wider. That way the guy can't just pull right in on top of you. you know. So that's one way we learn to deal with it. You don't turn around and, you know, they're curious. They're, they're, they're fans of the sport, you know. And, and, and unfortunately, this, we're the only sport like that. You can't get out of NASCAR. Well, I tell people, you ain't going to take you. Oh, one pal, I can get out there on the track, make a few laps with old Dale Jr. <laughs> But, you know, our world's different. You can get right inside our world, and I think that's why I think that's why the fishing fans, to me, out of all the sports I've ever been involved in, are probably the greatest. You know, they are true, loyal to the people they follow. They want to be a part of it. So it's, it's a little bit different. I've been to the ESPYs. I've hung out with some really nice sports players, people, and they are so disengaged from their fans, it ain't even real. I mean, I've been to the race with Greg Biffle, and I've sit in his motor home, and I've watched him race all around Bristol and win and leave, and he has no idea how many fans are there for him. He is so disconnected, it ain't even funny. And I told him that, sitting on the golf cart. I said, dude, you have no idea what life's like on that side of the fence. You don't. Our sport, I think that's the cool part about it, is when I take that boat out of the water on a classic, and I stand there in the parking lot, you can walk straight up to me and say, hey, how'd you do? I hope that I'm man enough not to give a bad answer and say, well, I've been duck hunting or something, but, you know, if you don't catch them, you know, you don't catch them. you got to man up to that. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you ever pre-fish with the competitors? Do I ever pre-fish with the competitors? Well, answer this in a two-part question. I'm not a firm believer in pre-fishing. It just doesn't work for me. And I'm going to tell you, it's the way my mind works. I process information very fast. Uh, and, and what happens at that time I fully believe in. So if I go fish two or three weeks out in advance or two months out in advance and I find a bunch of fish in the back of, say, Mink Creek, 
when I come back to fish the tournament, I'm going to spend half of my practice time in the back of Mink Creek trying to find them fish that may be gone. If I'd have spent that day and a half fishing for what the fish are doing right then, I'm going to have a better chance of winning. And I've just had to learn that over the years. I just don't pre-fish a lot. Uh, and, and I do pre-fish with competitors. If I'm going to go pre-fish like I did Louisiana this year, but I'll go ride it. I went and rode Louisiana Delta uh, when we went down there this year for that Texas tournament. I took a kid with me and I took Kenyon Hill. We rode 391 miles in two and a half days in the boat on, a, on the Humminbird trip maker. Almost 400 miles round trip. The guy with me said, dude, I ain't never been this far on a cruise line, much less than a bass boat. Never took a rod out. Never made a cast. Just simply want to learn my navigation and where I'm going. So I'm just not a firm believer in pre-fishing. It's just, now some people do. It's so weird because we have guys that go pre-fish and buddy, they can beat you with it. <laughs>